started. So uh, please allow me to introduce, uh, we have uh, two speakers with us today, uh, Professor Eric Budish, who is the Stephen G. Rothmeyer Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, Professor Budish works in the area of market design. Um, some of his work has won various awards. Uh, they have been implemented in real life. I believe the course allocation mechanism at Wharton still uses some of his designs. He has applied market design techniques and a price theory type approach to study uh, the implications, both economic and in terms of health, uh, of the COVID vaccination exercise that the entire world is going through now. We're very lucky to have him here with us today. Um, and second is uh, Eric Rosenkrantz, who is a, a veteran uh, of Southeast Asia. He's the founder and chairman of E3, which is a strategic advisory, which helps organizations determine and execute their long-term plans. Having been in Asia for a long time, he has a very wide range of experience. He's helped various multinational companies in terms of strategic directions, expansion in different markets. Um, and so I'll keep things short here. And Eric, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, I'll, either of you, I'll hand it over to you guys. This makes the introduction pretty easy. So thank you very much to join, for joining. Uh, Great. Thanks on. very much. It's, it, it's good to be with you all. And I'm going to talk, um, I think, or Eric, Eric, or do you want to introduce the format? But I'm going to talk for about yeah, 15 yeah, or 20 sure. minutes. So so since we have two Eric's here, I'm going to be officially known as Eric, and the other Eric is going to be officially known as Professor Eric. Um, and so what we, we've divided uh, the hour, the next hour, into three parts. Uh, in the first part, which will be approximately 20 minutes, uh, Professor Eric is going to present his research and his findings. Uh, and that'll be a nice little PowerPoint presentation. Uh, after that, uh, Professor Eric and I will engage in a kind of a dialogue in which I've prepared some questions and we'll do some uh, give and takes of back and forth. Um, during uh, Professor Eric's presentation and during our back and forth, uh, you, the participants, uh, are encouraged to ask questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. And in the last 20 minutes, I will um, look at those Q&As and I will ask those questions for you. So that'll be your chance to ask questions, but it'll be done through my voice. So having said that, Professor Eric, it's over to you. Thanks very much. I'm really, really glad to, to be with you all. Good morning from Chicago. Uh, and I'm gonna present research um, that's joined with a large number of, uh, of colleagues that I'll, I'll describe in, in, a, in a few slides. To, to start, as we know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been um, expensive in so many different dimensions, economically expensive, expensive in terms of lives lost, expensive in terms of the harm to education and human capital development, also just socially expensive. It's, it's, it's nice to be with you all on Zoom, but it's, uh, it's been socially expensive to, to all of us to, to live so much of our life on Zoom over the uh, over the last time, and, and it, it's been de detrimental to human relationships and human happiness. A way of thinking about this harm economically, and the way, way, the way we think of this harm economically in our, in our modeling exercise is to just use a dollar figure for harm per month. We're going to think of a lot of our analysis is going to be on a per month basis, is kind of speed of value of, this, of speed of ending the pandemic. And on a monthly basis, COVID-19 has been killing hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. I can, the recent flow is about 200,000 people per month. It's been, it's been higher or lower than that, depending on uh, the course of the pandemic. And the World Bank and the IMF have estimated the economic harm of the pandemic at on the order of $500 billion per month, about $10 trillion over the course of a two-year uh, two pandemic. Um, and these estimates are likely, the $500 billion a month is likely conservative because it's not taking into account all these other dimensions of harm I just alluded to. Uh, Larry Summers and David Cutler put out an analysis of the economic cost of the pandemic to just the United States. And that, that figure comes to $800 billion per month for the United States alone. So extrapolated globally, uh, you can easily get to 
to trillions of dollars of harm per month, so about, about $3 trillion per month if you, if you extrapolate the Cutler and Summers argument. Uh, and the, 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 given this harm and this harm that accumulates month by month, the approach our team has taken has to been to, to quantify and think about ways to accelerate the end of the pandemic through global vaccination. Um, accelerating vaccination could get us out of these costs uh, faster. And we, we have in mind large scale, throw, throwing large amounts of dollars uh, at, at capacity, with capacity defined comprehensively from the, you know, the factory that's producing vaccine all the way to the infrastructure that gets shots and arms. Uh, and also to make efficient use of existing, uh, existing capacity. So you use vaccine capacity, expansion of vaccine capacity as a way to end the costs of the pandemic faster. Let me spend one slide on why there might be a role for, uh, and why there has been a role for government involvement in this problem as opposed to letting the letting private market forces alone do their work. Um, we, we estimate that the value of vaccine capacity, uh, which is currently at about 3 billion annual courses, so a, a vaccine, globally vaccinating about 250 to 300 million people per month, we estimate that value as uh, $17 trillion. Uh, and you know, I've done a lot of, a lot of different economic studies over the course of my, my career, it is $17 trillion, a lot of money. Is it? And it's uh, $6,000 uh, per course of vaccine, vaccine capacity. Um, we estimate the value of incremental capacity. So on top of what we already have is on the order of a thousand bucks per course. The prices on the other hand, the observed prices of vaccines have been about five to $50 per course. So it depends on which vaccine and which, which deal. There's just a massive disconnect between the comprehensive social value of vaccinating the world and putting an end to the pandemic uh, and the, the prices observed in the market, um, prices paid to, to firms for, for vaccination, uh, for, for vaccine doses. And, the, and given this disconnect between the world desperately wants to end the pandemic, but prices are about 50 bucks, and one instinct could be we'll pay 5,000 bucks per course, but that's, that's, that's sort of not the right approach for a, a bunch of reasons. Um, but we, what, what, this, what this analysis highlights is just the huge gap between uh, the social, social and private benefits of producing additional uh, vaccine capacity. And a role for government is to help bridge the gap. And bridge the gap is kind of a euphemism or throw more money at the problem and throw money at the problem smartly. Um, so if you if you're if you're procuring something that's worth six thousand bucks per at a price of about fifty bucks per, you should procure more of it, and you should you should throw money at enabling yourself to uh, to procure more of it as fast as possible. So align private and social incentives. Here's a simpler way to say the main idea of, of our research: it just Accelerating vaccination is the world's easiest cost benefit calculation. Throw billions of dollars at solving a problem that is costing the world trillions of dollars. Billions are smaller than trillions. Um, this is work that I've, I've undertaken over the last year or so with a, a really large and diverse uh, team. Uh, it's been led by uh, Michael Kramer, who's a, a recent hire at the University of Chicago, a Nobel laureate of several years ago. Uh, and I'll, I'll report on, on, on a, a series of papers that conducted with this team. Uh, I'll, let me also flag my colleague, Kenneth Prendergast, uh, who's also with me at, at Chicago Booth. And he and I have been working closely together more recently uh, with, um, with COVAX on some, uh, on some ideas for how to efficiently use the vaccine capacity we already have. Um, this team wrote uh, two papers, the first one quite early in the pandemic. We really started it in about April of 2020. Uh, and the second of which was published um, in March of this year in Science. Um, and that's the title of today's talk, Market Design to Accelerate COVID-19 Vaccine Supply. And, and I'll, I'll talk about these two papers kind of as a holistic, uh, as a holistic whole uh, over the course of the next, uh, next 10 minutes or so. 
but roughly speaking, the first paper took the took an ex ante perspective from the perspective of April 2020 when there was massive uncertainty about which vaccines would work, um, wh whether any vaccines would work, um, how much money should governments throw at building out vaccine capacity, uh, quote, at risk. So building the capacity before you know uh, which vaccines are going to turn out uh, turn out to be effective. And then the second paper took a perspective of early 2021 and tried to do two things. One is it tried to quantify the value of the vaccine capacity then in place, which we estimated about 3 billion courses per year. And that's turned out to be a pretty good estimate for 2021. Uh, try to put a value on that and then try to think it prospectively about the value of, of still doing more, even at, even at a relatively late stage in the pandemic. And we also thought about some of the market design ideas for how best to build more. So how, how best to bridge the gap between the 6,000 bucks and the 50 bucks is kind of a simplified way of thinking about it. Um, so let me, get, let me get into the, give you a sense of the substance of the, the approach we took uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, and then uh, talk about uh, some of what we, what we think we should, uh, should do now. Um, so this, this team is engaged with policy along a number of, of fronts, again, from kind of early, relatively early in the pandemic in April of 2020 uh, up through present, this slide kind of ends with, uh, uh, ends with our work in March of 2021, but it, it's, it's been on, ongoing um, with some successes, some frustrations. It's, it's been a, a long 18 months for everybody. Um, so the, the ex ante problem we thought of as a, as a portfolio problem. You're a, a country um, facing uncertainty about what vaccines are gonna work, um, wh whether any vaccines are gonna work and wh which ones. Um, and in, the question is whether to invest at risk. So before you know which ones are gonna turn out to work, uh, to invest at risk in building out a uh, capacity for uh, for that vaccine. Um, the, so the, so it's a portfolio problem. We had a lot of risky bets. Um, we modeled the probability of success based on uh, conversations with a variety of, uh, of of medical experts and tried to put just some sim simple structure uh, on the on the probabilities of different different outcomes of success, and there's a lot. Oh, there's a lot of hazy uncertainty in the spring of 2020, as, as we all remember. Um, this is an example of of what a just to give you a, a sense of how the plumbing of the model works, and a, lar a large number of candidate vaccines uh, at different phases of development and with different different overall approaches to vaccinations. That's called a, a platform and a subcategory. Um, and out of this, um, and the, the, more, the more candidates you fund, um, the more likely some are going to be successful. Think of this as like a, a variation on, the, on a venture capital investing problem. Uh, but it's a, a different. The difference is you you really want to you, you really want to get enough successes to be able to vaccinate your your population. So there's actually this great metaphor by Larry Summers. Uh, where he said, imagine, uh, imagine your family's life depends on getting a pizza in the next one hour. You wouldn't just call one pizza place and, and make a delivery. You'd call 20 pizza places and order 20 different pizzas from 20 different places um, to make sure that one pizza, at least one pizza gets to you in an hour. And by the way, if 18 pizzas get to you in an hour and you've wasted 200 bucks, so if your family's life depends on it, that's, that's money really well spent. And that's the spirit of spend billions, but to save trillions. Um, the, the way we modeled the benefits of vaccination uh, was as a, as a flow where on the, this is again, just to give you a, a, scent, a flavor for how our modeling exercise worked. On the horizontal axis is the fraction of the population vaccinated and on the vertical axis is the, the benefits accrued so far. And we assume that the early doses have higher marginal benefit than later doses because we're early doses can target uh, higher risk, um, uh, higher risk or higher willingness to pay uh, individuals. Um, 
with, with higher higher marginal benefits. But there's benefits throughout until you until you reach short immunity, which unfortunately we haven't quite done yet. Um, here's a, a figure that helps us think through the economic benefits of what we call acceleration. So let's say that without any investment at risk, a vaccine uh, will be approved. What would be um, would be ready at time t, ready and ready in, in in production at time t zero, and by spending money building capacity uh, at risk, that could accelerate the initial availability of that vaccine by by t capital t months. So think of this as you're spending money in April of 2020, so that if in November 2021 um, the Pfizer vaccine is approved, uh, there's billions of courses of annual capacity ready to go starting in November of 2021. That's kind of a thought experiment. Um, and that, that saves a lot of time. It could save on, about on the order of six months to, to more. Um, so the benefits start accruing earlier and, and the quantity of the benefits that start accruing depends on how much capacity you build at risk. And that at some point, the, the firm will build capacity not at risk, because it kind of know it learns in November 2021, it's approved and uh, starts, starts building uh, de-risked capacity. So a risk component and a de-risk component. And one of our points is that governments could have played a stronger role in, in de-risking things. Um, this combination of, of just the vaccination benefits and this thinking about acceleration leads to a figure uh, that compares the, 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 the social benefits to not accelerating vaccination to the benefits of accelerating vaccination. And the, the, the difference between these green cur this green curve and the red curve kind of illustrates that, that difference by accelerating from the green to the red, you start getting benefits sooner and the benefits initially are relatively high and slow because you can target high risk and high value uh, populations earlier and you get this kind of funky shaped um, uh, benefits curve or, or, or value curve from accelerating vaccination because you, you finish here instead of here and you can kind of see throughout there's just it, it benefits from, from starting faster, ending the pandemic sooner. Um, and then, so this, this model, which had a, a, model of, a model of risk, a model of benefits, and then estimates on costs, spits out, um, spits out an optimal portfolio. As an example, in the United States, our model said that we sh the United States should have invested at risk in 27 uh, candidates with about 400 million courses of, of risked capacity per month, so 5 billion of courses of, of risk capacity per year. Um, some of which would work, some of which wouldn't work, um, but that's an example of the kind of calculation we did. Um, and if, if the world had followed this uh, portfolio optimization uh, of the vaccines that turned out to work, um, we would have had uh, 7 billion courses of, of approved of capacity at risk of vaccines that turned out to work for 2021. And the world could have finished vaccinating by uh, a couple months from now. Uh, and instead, we kind of got to about 3 billion courses of, of capacity for vaccines that turned out to work. And at, at present, we're on track to finish vaccination sometime in 2022. Um, the, the paper in science took the perspective of, OK, what's the, what's the value of the 3 billion we did get? So that, here I sort of sounded like a downer, like, oh, we only got 3 billion, we should have gotten to 7 billion. A more a positive spin is we got the 3 billion vaccine courses of global capacity, much of which was at risk. A lot of credit goes to, um, to Pfizer and to Operation Warp Speed and to some other, other risky investments that turned out to work. Um, the, the Operation Warp Speed did $15 billion. We think it should have done $150 billion, but 15 is a lot bigger than zero. Um, and the 3 billion courses of capacity that the world put in place for 2021, um, we estimate had a comprehensive economic value of about $17 trillion. Uh, and is, is enough if you kind of just do the math of 3 billion courses of annual capacity, uh, how long will it take to vaccinate the world with that much capacity? About 23 months and high income countries faster, kind of by end of 2021, which, which looks about 
about right at this moment, although the Delta thing is throwing a lot of uncertainty in the air. What then is the value of building more capacity um, and the value of putting in an extra billion courses of annual capacity? So should we do more? Or we estimated about another trillion dollars uh, and could speed up global vaccination by several months. Uh, the speed up at this stage, so thinking from August, 2021, the speed up of putting in additional capacity will mostly accrue to middle income and lower income countries because higher income countries have been kind of at the top of the queue um, uh, for purchasing early, early vaccine business. We're, we're willing to pay the 50 bucks a course uh, that the, the early successes turned out to cost. Um, how, how, to, how to increase capacity um, is a, a question that involves a lot of market design and, con and contract design. And I'll make a couple quick points. So one is that at a high level, our point is there's a massive gap between the value of vaccine capacity and its cost. So throw money at plugging that gap. And you, in economic speak, solicit bids. So solicit bids from, uh, from pharmaceutical firms, for example, to produce more, more capacity quickly, spend billions to save, uh, save trillions. A, a point about these contracts is we think it's important to contract on capacity per se, as opposed to vaccine doses. So this is a mistake we think some has been made at points in the pandemic. And the issue is that if I contract on doses, uh, but without a delivery date or without a specific promise to install more capacity, that might just get my country to the back of the queue. Or so that might get my country to the back of the queue. Uh, or if I specify a, a number of doses with a delivery date, I might just bump other countries to the back of the queue. Uh, so countries that, so contracts that explicitly specify both timing, but also provisions for incremental capacity that will deliver the doses to me uh, are, are what we, we encourage. And it's basically trying to, again, bridge the gap between firms' private incentives and the social benefit of vaccinating quickly. Um, uh, and then we, we also advocate uh, just investing in, in supply chains. Uh, everything from the fact that the inputs into the vaccine production process to, to the, the supply chains for getting shots, uh, shots into arms. But at a, at a super high level, just throw money at solving the problem fast. I was, I was lamenting to a friend, a friend last night uh, about, you know, we were talking about the pace of vaccination in Chicago. When, when Uber and Lyft were trying to get off the ground, there were more people on, on sidewalks handing out coupons to try Uber and Lyft than there currently is uh, public investment in trying to get un the unvaccinated to get vaccinated. Uh, just throw money at the problem and do it, do it smartly, but with, with cash. Um, stretching capacity is another, uh, another avenue we explored in the science paper. And there are a lot of potential ideas to, for how to take the capacity we currently have in place and make, make more efficient use of it, given, given the value of speed. So first doses first, tinkering with, with, um, uh, with dosage, um, utilizing even the lower efficacy vaccines fully. So one of the calculations we did is, suppose you have access to AstraZeneca now or Pfizer Moderna several months from now. Uh, what's the value of using, what, what's, which one should you choose? And there's a lot of economics tor pushing towards, just use what you can get right away to, to put an end to the costs of the pandemic, even if imperfectly. Um, and and the, the meta point is just, there's a huge value to information uh, that could come from smart experiments for that, that teaches us how to, how to make the most of, of what we currently have. Um, and I've, I've worked with Canis and also with Scott Commoners at Harvard Business School uh, with uh, COVAX on what we call cross-country vaccine exchange. This is another idea for how to make efficient use of what we already have. You know, the idea is if a country has vaccine A, but it's optimized around distributing vaccine B, for instance, because of uh, vaccine uh, supply chain logistics issues, like some vaccines require uh, cold storage and some don't, 
Um, how do we efficiently reallocate uh, vaccines across countries? If, if based on the early deals or based on the COVAX allocation process, uh, we're not quite at, at an efficient allocation. Um, let me kind of, let me wrap with some lessons for, for future pandemics. Uh, the first one is just invest at risk, you know, throw money at the problem uh, with even if, even if at risk. Uh, and, and related is that investment in capacity translates to speed of ending the pandemic. Um, the second point is, again, kind of a high level point is that private incentives for speed are just not aligned with social incentives and especially at fixed prices. So let me, let me put this in a very simplified way. Suppose there's a pharma firm that sells a billion courses at 40 bucks a course, uh, and it's a fixed price. It earns the same $40 billion if those billion courses are sold in 12 months as if they're sold in one month. But selling it, producing a billion courses in one month as opposed to 12 months requires 12 times the fixed costs. So you're just not gonna get speed from a private firm if you're con contracting at a fixed cost, especially a relatively low fixed cost relative to the massive social value of, of ending the pandemic. And then last, I think with the benefit of hindsight, we needed a new play uh, in the epidemiology playbook. Um, so first to vaccinate as fast as possible, throwing, throwing massive dollars behind that often at risk. And then in the interim, what I've called in separate work, uh, maximize utility subject to R less than one, subject to preventing uh, exponential spread uh, of the virus. And the, the kind of price theory of this, of this new play in the epi, epi playbook, I'll, I'll make this point, if this will be the, the last remark I'll make, um, is so you, you've all by now probably come across the, the term R naught, so the reproductive rate of a virus. Um, this, this, fi this figure plots um, R naught against total infections and total, uh, total deaths. It focuses on the United States, a population of 300 million, but it extrapolates in kind of the obvious way. Um, and there's a discontinuity, as we all know by now, at around one. So if the, if the virus grows exponentially, the number, this is a, the cumulative number of infections and deaths over a 12 month period. Um, the, um, the number of, of infections grows quite rapidly if, if there's exponential growth kind of topping out with everybody getting it if, if R is a two, two or more or so. Um, so if you can get R to less than one, you've basically done all of the work, all, all of, the work of, of preventing infection and, and death uh, without uh, necessarily fully eradicating the virus before you get, get to a vaccine. So take this figure, let me skip the next two slides. Um, take this figure and flip it. Let me focus you on panel A. We are now R is higher on the left than on the right. Uh, so so to going to the right means lower reproductive rate. And vertically is the benefits of reducing, uh, of reducing the, the, the spread of um, uh, the, the reproductive rate of the virus. You get a curve that looks like this, where again, there's kind of a kink at one. So the benefits of reducing the spread of the virus are steeply increasing and then kind of flatten out once you hit R less than one. Whereas the costs of mitigation are gonna be a more traditional economic uh, convex cost curve where the more you mitigate, the more expensive it is. And this points you to, you should get all the way to R less than one and then just kind of stop. Um, and then a way to think about masks and rapid testing, um, social distance is these are ways to reduce the cost of mitigation without societal, uh, societal lockdown. So to make the R less than one play um, more economically appealing. There are other plays in the playbook. So for a virus that costs more to mitigate than is the benefit of reducing its spread, you should just ignore it. Um, there are some, uh, some pandemic threats where the optimal is to partially mitigate. So to mitigate somewhat, but then you kind of run out of, run out of tricks. So the HIV pandemic is probably an example of this sort where you could, um, educate as much as possible about condoms and sheer, needle shearing and how the virus spreads. But at some basic level, no, 
public official seriously considered trying to ban sexual intercourse. So, so you kind of run out run out of tricks for how to how, how to mitigate the spread of the virus. Um, to get suppression to our much less than one, so which I would think of as like a full draconian lockdown, it's actually pretty hard. Um, but eradication is a great play if, if available and, and countries that manage to eradicate, um, uh, fully eradicate the virus. I mean, they, they, they did a better job than the United States did, for example. Uh, but let, let me stop here. I've talked, to, I, I've been talking a while and Eric R and, and Eric B are gonna now have a, uh, a conversation. So thank you very much for, um, for your time and interest. Great, thank you, Professor Eric. That was terrific. I learned a lot. I'm not sure I understood a lot of the math, but uh, uh, I think I got the conclusions. Uh, boy, do I have a lot of questions. Um, and I wanna get into issues regarding developed versus developing markets. I wanna get into supply versus demand. Uh, but let me start by asking about your model. And you, you did kind of address this question at the end, but I want you to go into a little bit more detail on it. Um, I'm curious about how your model works with the different effectiveness rates of the different vaccines, okay? And the one shot versus two shot issue. So certainly here in Asia, we have a lot of countries that are only gonna be giving uh, Sinovac or Sinopharm, which call it 50% effectiveness. Uh, most developed countries, US are giving Pfizer Moderna at 95%. So how did, how, what impact does the different effectiveness of the viruses have on your model? Yeah, very, very important question. And the, um, the, so the, the way the, let me give you kind of the plumbing answer and then, and then the practical answer. The plumbing answer is the, the way the model works is that the sooner you start vaccinating, um, the sooner people can, get back to normal levels of economic and, and social activity. Um, the faster you vaccinate, the faster, the more, the more people can quick can get back to um, typical levels of economic and social activity. A 95% effective vaccine accomplishes that per, per dose accomplishes that more effectively than a 70% effective vaccine. But you'd rather have two two people worth of 70% efficacy than one person of 95% efficacy. And you'd also rather have 70% efficacy now than 95% efficacy six months from now, because the 70% the protection is still quite a lot of protection, especially if you can vaccinate large parts of the population. So it, it's sort of like that you're, you're buying efficacy at a price and you're buying it at a, at a time. And the, fa the faster, you, the, one of the calculations we do is that you're better off having a 70% effective vaccine deployed immediately than a 95% effective vaccine deployed three months from now. And it, it's, a, it's a little sensitive to parameters, but like speed is so important. Uh, if, the, if the world had all, if the whole world had taken AstraZeneca by, I'm not, I'm not a, Sorry, I'm not a medical expression. I, I, I shouldn't speak so casually. But if there were a 70% effective vaccine that the whole world had taken by now, um, we'd be in a much better position, even, even if 70% is less than 95%. All right. Now, so I know a lot of your work was done over the last, let's say, 6 to 12 months. Um, now, what I'm going to ask about is something that's happening today. Mm -hmm. which is we're starting to get some soft data that's generally starting to harden, which is the vaccine is giving up its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing in Israel, which was the earliest vaccinated country, is that vaccinated people are starting to get sick. Um, and there's a lot of talk now about a third shot or a booster shot. Mm -hmm. So how does your model account for that? What does your model say about booster shots um, if your model hasn't addressed that, can you extrapolate? Yeah, that's a, another great, uh, great and, and very timely question. So first of all, let me, let me kind of almost ask the flip of that question, which is suppose COVID does become endemic, then to the 
and and the, the medically optimal thing to do is for everybody to get vaccinated annually or, or twice annually, whatever the right rate is. That that tells us a level of capacity that would be great to have in place and it's gonna be a lot more than we currently have in place. We might, um, for example, to vaccinate, uh, vaccinate the world every year would require 7 billion courses of, of annual capacity, uh, which is more than we currently have in place by about double. So if the virus becomes endemic, the, and so something I'm worried about is that we get to a, a conflict between um, people in wealthier countries rightly wanting and, 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 and demanding of their leaders a third shot and people in poorer countries still waiting for their first shot. That's a horrible conflict to mediate who get, you know, it's like Solomon's dilemma. The way to mediate it is to just have enough for both. Like it's just not that expensive relative to the value of global vaccination. So I have this, I have this kind of accumulated frustration that's built that, that the, it, it, the, the way, I mean, Solomon's dilemma you can't solve because there's one baby. This dilemma you can solve by throwing money at building more vaccine capacity. Well, but let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. You yeah. said several times that the solution is to throw money at the problem. Is that a, uh, with respect to a developed market answer? Um, if you're Indonesia, if you're Afghanistan, if you're Lao and you don't have that money to throw at it, what do you do then? The money may not exist in certain. Countries. Well, so for for I, I think the the world should throw money at the problem, and for for that that might in, include richer countries helping poor countries. I'm, I'm not speaking with any precision or deep experience in global politics, or but but philosophically. Um, if, if my family needs food and we're supposed to throw money at the problem of getting food, it's not my three-year-old's job to, to buy the food. It's my job. And if, if the world needs, I mean, adult, it's not the right, quite the right metaphor, but you know, the, if the world needs vaccination capacity, countries with the ability to, the, the means to afford it, afford it should, should, should pony up, pay up. Okay, and, so, and, sorry. Go yeah, on. go ahead. And, and no, I think so, there's like some, there's some, I, I, I sense like some nervousness about um, paying big pharma. I'm like kind of caricaturing, but I, I worry there's a little bit of that fear in the background of, well, if we, if we end up overpaying to pharmaceutical firms, that that's, I, I worry that that might be a source of hesitation and just throwing money at the problem. Yeah, economically. I, I, again, that may be a developed market issue. I'm yeah, not sure in might, developing might markets they care about that. So yeah. um, to simplify your thesis, what you're saying is a shot that costs $50 can yield $1,000 of uh, economic value. Therefore, governments around the world should throw money at it and get the shot into everybody. So let's address supply chain issues, okay? How are you gonna distribute the vaccine to Afghanistan? How are you gonna distribute it to the 6,000 islands in Indonesia? Um, one of our questions from uh, Usman Munir asked, how do we create an end-to-end -end supply chain? So how do you actually get the doses into people's arms? So that, look, I, I think that's a, an important question. Um, my my expertise does not reach how to how to reach the 5,000th island in Indonesia. At, at, at some basic level, no no one team can have all all answers, and it's a complicated problem. Um, that said, saying that highlighting the economic value of solving the problem can and and the fact that private market forces alone might not get you there is should be a spur to whoever does have the local on the ground expertise to, to vaccinate Indonesia to, to do so but with more you, resources. Did you build that into the cost side of your model? So you said the vaccine costs $50, but then there's the cost of distribution. Then there's the cost of getting it into people's arms. A lot of countries don't have the nurses mm -hmm. um, who are trained to give the inoculation, okay? Um, so 
were, did your model deal with those types of costs? No, I think can, candidly, no. I, th I think we we um, we we model. We're, what we're trying to do is put a value on uh, it, it, two related things. One is just put a put a value on vaccine capacity, where we, we and we're explicit about this in the science paper. Where capacity we broadly construe is not just the, the, the capacity at the manufacturing plant, but inputs into the production process and then supply chain and logistics out after the production process. So the whole, whole shebang, if you will. Um, so we can put a, an economic value on that. It's high. The thousand bucks and the 6,000 bucks are both um, for a variety of reasons, likely very conservative. I mean, they don't, they don't even try to get into the, um, the, the social and education consequences of the, uh, of the pandemic, the, the, harm, the harm to human capital around the, uh, around the world. And, um, so so your, your conclusion would be that the value of the vaccine so far outweighs the cost even if we put in the cost of hiring nurses, even if we put in the distribution costs and the supply chain costs, the value is so high that we've just got to get it into everybody. And governments around the world have to spend, steal or borrow the money to do this. I think at some, I mean, that, that sounds like a caricature on the one hand, but it, I think kind of, yeah. Like I, like I said on the third slide, it's the world's easiest cost benefit calculation, spend billions to save trillions. You know, from yeah, the perspective yeah. of August 2021, thing I don't want to because we 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 have accomplished quite a lot, right? We're we're on pace to vaccinate three to four billion people globally this year. So the and the and and can't and in the model and in reality, the earlier vaccinations are are higher economic value than than later vaccinations because they're getting to higher risk, higher value people in richer countries. So six thousand dollars per course is a global average, and that's averaging high-income countries and, and lower-income countries. So the the you know I, I I mean I somewhat ironically the, at at this stage of the pandemic a lot of the a lot of the value of building out uh, building out capacity will a lot of the economic value of building out capacity will accrue to relatively poor countries. You know, Lower income and middle income countries. Um, okay, let's let's shift away from supply side to demand side for a second. Um, we're seeing a percentage vaccinated top out in developed countries at let's say seventy five percent to pick a number, right. uh, and we're well aware that in the U S. there's a large percentage of people who just refuse to get vaccinated. But it's not a U.S. problem. In Australia, where basically they only have AstraZeneca, Australians don't want to take AstraZeneca because they're afraid of blood clots. So vaccination in Australia is less than, what, 5%, something like that. Uh, here in Singapore, we've got a significant number of people who just say, I don't want to take it. So how do you handle that issue, that there are just people who are just not going to take the vaccine? And what does that do to your calculations and your model? So that, that's an, there's a, a, another great and hard question. Uh, let me say let me say a couple different make a couple different points on that one. That's a hard one, and we're, we're it's which it's very visceral at the moment where where I sit in the United States. Um, so first of all, vaccine hesitancy I, at some basic level don't have expertise on. So let me let me punt on the like what's the source of vaccine hesitancy? Um, what are the, let, let me na next make kind of an epidemiology point, which is in the in the SIR style models, so the susceptible infected recovered that I alluded to on these last few slides with the Epi playbook. Um, the uh, the pandemic ends or the when, when society reaches herd immunity and herd immunity can come through vaccinations or infections. Um, so um, that, and vaccination is the preferred way to get to herd immunity. 
Um, but infections are another way to get to herd immunity. And at some, at some level, just the gravity of the virus, like just kind of the, the math of the virus is that people who don't get vaccinated, and this might not apply to a country that's really controlled, essentially eradicated the virus locally and is willing to close its borders. So it might not, it might not apply to all countries, but in the United States, at least, I suspect where we're going is that we will have herd immunity in some number of months that comes from a vaccinated portion of the population and an infected portion of the population. But at some point you just run out of new places for the virus to go. Um, now there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty to that statement. The vaccines might not be as effective as, as we hope and et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's sort of the math of the virus. It's gonna get to, at some point, everybody's gotta be immune or locked in their room somewhere. And immunity can come from a vaccine or from getting it and surviving. All right, let's, uh, let's go to some of the questions being asked. So uh, Jared Wooler, who's an administrator at the Mayo Clinic, says he's been following your work for several years and, and congratulates you and appreciates your work. And he asks, uh, apropos of um, throw money at the problem, he asks if you have uh, had the chance to meet, let's say, with the Gates Foundation, Open Philanthropy, or any other people with billions of dollars at hand, shown them your model and convinced them to throw money at the problem. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, so, so that question would be best addressed to um, my collaborator and, and this distinguished, distinguished collaborator, Michael Kramer, and he, he's had the most of those kinds of conversations. Um, but so, so the, 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 the very short and un, unsatisfying answer is yes, our group has talked to those kinds of entities and yes, the world is where it is. And you can kind of, the Operation Warp Speed in the United States is sort of a good, good sort of example of, of, of my sense of things, which is on the one hand, the US invested $15 billion at risk in, um, in vaccine capacity. And our, our team had, you know, had spoken with, uh, um, uh, with, with Operation Warp Speed, with the folks running Operation Warp Speed. And on the other hand, it should have spent $150 billion if you believe our model. And it's sort of, I, you know, the Gates Foundation, I think is one of the, has, has supported some of the entities behind COVAX, but I, I don't have a fully satisfying answer to, your, to that great question. And, but okay, and thanks so, also for your interest yeah. in the work. So Edwin from Indonesia is asking, he asked a question and then he asked a follow-up question. And I think almost the follow-up question was related to something I said. So his first question was your thousand dollar benefit for inoculation. Um, is that the same in a developed country like the US versus a developing country, for example, Indonesia? Is it the same value? Uh, and then I was making the point that some countries don't have the money um, to distribute it. And Edwin then followed up by saying, why doesn't a country like Indonesia have the money? Um, why can't a country like that find the money? which gets back, I guess, to the Gates question. So, so I guess two questions from Indonesia. Uh, one, um, is your model $1,000 the same for developers, developing countries? And two, how do developing countries find the money? Great, so, bo bo so Edward, Edward and Eric, are, thank, you, thank you for those questions. So the, 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 the plumbing of the model does take into account um, GDP differences across countries and break the world into high income, upper middle income, lower middle income, and lower income. Um, and the thousand bucks and the six thousand bucks are are weighted averages over countries. So it'll be tend to be higher for richer countries and tend to be lower for poorer countries. Um, yeah, we did a, a separate paper that I, I wasn't one of the co-authors on, but Michael Kramer wrote with, with some of the other members of the, uh, of the AHT team that went through the thought experiment for a, a, a poor country and argued that even, even for a quite poor country, self-financing vaccination is economically, uh, is economically justified. Now there's a question of who pays for it. And there might be the, 
kind of battle of wills. Well, maybe I can get someone else to pay for it. And now my first best is for someone else to pay for it right away. Second best is for me to pay for it right away. But that you know, bargaining can sometimes lead to lead to delay, as we all know. So, but that, that, those are the two thoughts I have. Um, so my, my, my kind of instinct is, is for, for rich and poor, vaccination is economically a, 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 an easy win for, for cost-benefit analysis. Who pays for it, it's harder. And, we, and can lead now, to kind of global bargaining issues. Now, William, um, and I haven't gotten his last name, so just William, uh, has asked an interesting question, um, something I'm struggling, a lot of people are struggling with. Mm -hmm. So he makes the point that there are countries, um, <clears throat> New Zealand, Australia, he says China, I would put Singapore in there, mm -hmm. um, that have done very well in controlling the virus um, by essentially shutting the borders. And places like Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, our islands, we can shut our border. So I guess the question he's asking is, how do we evaluate the long-term value of a policy of just shutting your border mm -hmm. um, versus the um, downside, economic downside of not having business com businessmen come in, not having travel, not having economic value from uh, having an open border? So how, how do you play with those variables, shutting yeah, the border that, versus opening the border? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. So. I, thinking back to the Epi playbook slide I, I posted at the very end, um, the 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 two good plays in the playbook for the for the period pre pre global herd immunity, so pre global either vaccination or infection, the two best plays were um, zero COVID. So the, some countries were able to execute that by. Um, competent contact tracing uh, and testing and some, some you know, border control quarantines on the way in and out of the country, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and that, that's what I called fixed cost of eradication. Pay, pay a large fixed cost of setting up the test and trace apparatus and setting up the quarantines on the near airports, but, but then you can have a society that runs somewhat normally while waiting for global herd immunity, while waiting for the vaccine. And, <coughs> excuse me, and then the other good play in the playbook was the maximize utility subject to R less than one play. Just some combination of what we're not gonna eradicate, but, but what with, with, rat, with uh, rapid testing and with some social distance policies and uh, banning certain kinds of events like that, that could be massive super spreaders um, keeping the virus contained until vaccination that way. At some point, unless Australia's plan or unless the zero COVID country's plan is to close their borders indefinitely, at some point, you got to get to herd immunity and the ways to get there with infection or vaccination. So I, I don't really have like a, a strong opinion for what to do in August 2021, but at some point over the next call it 12 months, 24 months, six months. And that, at some point that, that, that strategy, you, you wanna also complement that strategy with vaccination. And a country that's um, government is effective enough or strong-willed enough or whatever phrase you wanna to use to close its borders and get to zero COVID might also be strong and effective enough to get to, to, to mandate vaccination. The US is not that kind of country, just to, for better or worse, it's just not who we are. So we have a question from an, yeah, we, we have a question from an anonymous person. So I'll just mm -hmm. say Mr. and Mrs. Anonymous here. Um, and you, earlier in your presentation, I think you talked about um, taking 12 months to distribute or taking one month to distribute, right? 12 times right. as much. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Mr. Anonymous was referring to that, but he's asking the question about the expiration um, cycle of some of these mm -hmm. vaccines. So they expire after a certain amount of time. And have you built that into your distribution model? But you could build up all these vaccines, but then if they expire or go bad or not kept in cold storage, you've got wastage. So how was that built into your model? Yeah, great. great. Another, uh, keep the questions coming. These are great. Um, okay. So wastage, we think about 
I, I at least think about most directly in the context of this work I've been doing with Kenneth Prendergast and Scott Commoners um, with, uh, with COVAX. And what we're, we're trying to, to help them with, and we're as, as pro bono academic advisors, not, not officially a part of the organization, but what, what we're trying to help them with is thinking through ways to facilitate exchange, um, it could be across vaccines or it could be across time to prevent wastage. Um, and if you, if you, if there's vaccine capacity, if there are vaccine doses that are soon to expire um, and they're owned by country A, but country, country A can't or won't deploy those vaccines to its population, could be for the AstraZeneca hesitancy reason that we talked about in the last question, or it could be for some logistics supply chain um, competence reason. Uh, how do we get those vaccines from country A to country B that can, can quickly deploy, deploy those doses? And the, the legal complexities in the background are, are sort of depressing. Is to get, to get vaccines from country A to country B and involves a four-party uh, contract between the two countries, the manufacturer, uh, potentially COVAX, um, and a lot of the a lot of the legal issues are who who is liable if something goes wrong, and the legal issues can be a, a source of a friction that prevent it, it causes vaccines to then go to waste. And meanwhile, it can in the in the shadow of, of legal fights over uh, over uh, liability, we have vaccines going to waste. We have a global pandemic that's still still kicking. So uh, yet yet another source of um, you, you, I, I have a colleague who grew up in a in a war torn country, uh, escaped from civil war, and his his attitude on life is it's a miracle anything works, and I, I vacillate between it's a miracle anything works and then some despondence that we haven't done a better job. Uh, so, are you okay for a few more questions? Oh yeah, please keep it coming. This is great. Yeah. So. Um... Philip asked a question that I hadn't thought about. Um, and so Philip is saying that uh, a number of countries and especially in Europe, um, they were doing free testing. So if you thought you had uh, COVID, you could get a free test. Mm -hmm. And they're now starting to charge people for the tests. Yeah. And the reason they're charging people is not they wanna make money on the tests, but they wanna use that as a way to push people to getting the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So is that a smart thing to do? I guess that, that, that talks to the demand side of it. How do we get more people to take the vaccine? Yeah. And you know, the US is giving free lottery tickets. Europe is charging people for testing. What do you, what do you say to all of that? I, at, some at some level, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 a little bit, of, it's a, outside my expertise. I don't, I, don't, I, don't get, I don't get the vaccine hesitancy in an intellectual or um, or even intuitive way on the one hand. I, I think it's important to be respectful of it in the sense that, you know, the vaccines are still kind of new. Um, FDA still hasn't given full approval in the United States or like that. It's not, I, 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 I don't like it when people are extremely condescending to the, the vaccine hesitant on the one hand, a lot of people live with, you know, relatively low information environment, uh, have reasons to distrust experts. It, 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 I, it's, a, it's a hard subject. Um, and, but throwing, using, using incentives, carrots, sticks, nudges, whatever, whatever you like, but just throwing the whole, whole suite of, of, of tools at, at helping get the world vaccinated strikes me as a good idea. Um, but I don't, I don't feel like I have a better, a, a more focused answer than that. It's a hard, yeah, well, hard I, good question. I, I think you've kind of answered Ian's question. So Ian said that he agrees with you that time is of the F essence. And he describes various ways to use time. You could um, uh, for example, dilute the doses and give a half dose to people, mm -hmm. which stretches things out. 
-hmm. you could spend resources. And he asks your opinion, maybe not based on a model, but your opinion, do you feel that the policies being put in place by the governments today are the correct ones or should be something be done differently? So the, let me let me kind of speak to so the, the the like the dose stretching ideas or dose dilution ideas uh, sh strike me and my my collaborators you know, as, as a way a way to pull more vaccination out of existing capacity. I think the the thing we can be confident about is that the value of learning what dose stretching techniques work, the value of that is high. So the, the value of experiments that enable us to wring more vaccination out of a out of the current stock of capacity, that value is the informational value is high. And the other thing we can say confidently is, is the value of having more capacity is, is high. That's kind of the, the thing I've been saying for the last hour. Um, I don't. I genuinely don't have a um, a way to adjudicate between those two different ways to spend money. And it's part of part of the you know, trillions is greater than billions. Is you know, if you're if you're the budget guy, you're thinking, well, do I spend it on A or B? And we're we're kind of saying spend it on everything. It's all. Build, spend billions to save trillions, but but I, I understand where where that hits a wall in in reality, and, and I, I don't have a way of adjudicating between those two competing okay. ways to spend money. I think they're both yeah. both good ideas. I think I think we should probably wrap it up now. Um, <laughs> I got uh, I I like to simplify things, uh, so I wrote down two things: one, throw money at the problem, uh, and two, it's a miracle that anything works. Um, so, uh, Professor Eric, do you want to summarize or give us any concluding I, I thoughts? Think, I think I'll give you give you the last word. Look, the last year has been the last year and a half has been a um, heartbreaking in so many ways, and we'll we'll do a lot of post game on how the world responded to this to this moment, and there have been some there have some been some miracles and some failures. There have been some. The, the fact that we have a f effective vaccines is a, a medical scientific miracle. The, the fact that we're getting billions of shots into arms is a, uh, is a governmental and logistics and economic miracle you know, relative to the, you know, relative to the, the you know, any, it's a miracle anything works alternative. Um, but we could have done a lot better and I think we'll be we'll doing we, we'll be doing post game on this for a while to to learn from the ways we, we could have done better, um, and I think the costs are you know that I, I I have small children in the next in the next room and I think about the costs they've faced over the last uh, last year and a half and and we're we're the luck we're some of the lucky ones you know they could, um, but the, the I, th I think the costs of the pandemic have been just so so vast you know people. Health, health costs, the educational costs, and we we did a we did a good job, but we should have done a great job. I think, I think we'll be we'll be studying how to do better next time. And, uh, try to try to find, focus on the positive, not the negative. Well, well, Professor Eric, I would say you did a great job. So, uh, on behalf of everybody, I wanted to thank you. Uh, well done. And then let me turn it back over to Ben. Is that the right person to turn it back over to? We'll turn it over to Reggie. Thank, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. It was, it was really great sure. to be with you. So, uh, so thank you both, uh, Eric, Professor Eric and Eric Arzenkrantz. It was a great conversation. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, the salient points of your research and sharing with the alumni. Uh, and as a tradition, uh, we would like to promote all the attendees to become panelists and take a couple of pictures and then <laughs> wish everybody good night. Thank you very much for uh, absolutely fantastic conversation, Eric. Uh, Eric R. <laughs> for engaging the audience and the professor. Thank you very much. On behalf of the thank club, you. I'd like you uh, to thank for the time uh, and also take questions patiently. We ran a bit over time, but I think it was well worth the time spent. Thank you very much. Thank you.